Well, we started this year off by talking about faith, the necessity of faith, and how to acquire it. The next few weeks, we're going to take the opportunity to uh, look at a few faith stories. Faith is critical in the life of a growing and thriving Christian. In fact, I would go so far to say that a Christian cannot live a fulfilling life as a Christian without faith. No faith, no Christian. Now maybe that seems harsh, but what Jesus calls us to is something that we have to do by faith. We can't understand it all. And so faith is a very, very important um, characteristic or or piece of the Christian walk. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines faith as a belief and trust in loyalty to God. Firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Something that is believed, especially with strong conviction. Interesting. I think I like Paul's definition a little bit better. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I like that definition, faith. Sometimes I think we get faith and belief mixed up. You see, belief is what we hold here. We can believe all kinds of things, but faith is the action that goes along with that belief. This morning, you believe that that pew would sit down with you. Or sit down with you. It would support you when you sat down on it. <laughs> I didn't see anybody come to your pew and say, now, is this, is this, what did they use to, I didn't see anybody checking it. You believed that it would support you. But then you acted on that and you sat down. That is faith. Belief and faith. For Christians, we must live a life of faith. So today, we begin a series of, on faith. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we invite you to continue with us now. May your spirit open our hearts and minds, and may we learn from you. From your word we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Beginnings, the book of Genesis. We are most familiar with the book of Genesis because of the creation story. When somebody says Genesis, one of the first things we think of is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We have the story of the beginning of our world. Now, not the way we understand it today, but the beginning of this world. We read that in the first two chapters of Genesis, how God took the time to to design and build and, and form all the things that we see around us. And then, unfortunately, we read in the next chapter about how man threw it all away, how they thought they knew better. They, dis- they, they believed a lie. Then we continue to read and we find out the dire consequences of that sin in the first murder recorded in human history when Cain took the life of his brother. Then in Genesis chapter 5, we read about some generations that passed from Adam, our first father, to the time of Noah. We read through all those things and boy, when you start doing the math, it's a long time in those few short verses. Then we uh, come to Genesis chapter 6, and Moses writes for us about the messed up world that had become. It's not what God designed, but it's where things ended up. As time had passed, some of those uh, humans on earth had chosen to remain faithful to God, the one who their fathers and their forefathers told them about, who designed the world, who created it perfect. But then there were also some who decided that they wanted to do their own thing. This story about God didn't really didn't make a whole lot of sense. And they decided to do their own thing, to do their own pleasures. And as we continue on in Genesis, chick, uh, Genesis chapter 6, in the opening verses, uh, these verses have brought up all kinds of crazy ideas. From ideas of demigods to aliens. Many of the, these ideas coming from the opening verses of chapter 6 have stemmed more from Greek mythology than biblical history. If we look at the context of Genesis 6, we read in verse 2 that the sons of God, those who remained faithful to God, and the daughters of men, those who were unfaithful to God, came together and had children. Well, that's pretty normal. Men and women, procreation. It's what God designed. And so it happened. But then we're told that there were uh, people of great renown. This is where it gets interesting. 
This is where many people go wild with their imaginations. These children of these mixed pairs were known not for their love and dedication to God, but rather for the fulfillment of their own desires. There's reason to believe that the term used here in Genesis 6, Nephilim, referred to violent ones, terrorists, rather than physical giants. We are coming down from Adam and Eve, the first two perfect people. We understand them to be much larger than ourselves, and all the people in that time were giants, what we would consider giants. However, the giant term used here is talking rather about the attitude and the characteristic of the people, what they did. We understand this kind of terminology. Today, if we have um, a mass murderer, uh, a person who does horrible things to children, whatever the case may be, we call them monsters, right? They, have, they are giants of atrocities. So we understand the language of the Scripture. These people of renown, they were giants. They were giants in the atrocities and the uh, self-serving actions that they did. They were horrible people. Now, in case you think I'm being too hard on them, let's turn to verse 11. Verse 11 and 12 of Genesis 6. We read here, "The, The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. So everything was good, right? (laughs) How many times do you say corrupt? It's corrupt, it's corrupt, it's corrupt. There's no way you can read anything else into that passage, but the earth is corrupt. These giants were corrupt people doing terrible things. The outstanding feature of planet earth at this point, God's creative work was that it was corrupt. It was far from what God designed. And in fact, the earth was so corrupt, we go back a couple verses to verse 5 and 6, and we read, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How many more uh, adjectives can you put there to describe how terrible it was? Every thought all the time continually was evil. It was a bad, bad situation. Earth was corrupt. Every moment of their thoughts were evil. Things must have been terrible in the situation um, as we read this. Things were just absolutely horrendous. And we go on in the verse, in verse 6, and the Lord was sorry that He made man on the earth. And He was grieved in His heart. God, the one who had formed the creatures of earth, the one who'd been in the dust to form man, was grieved in his heart. He was saddened. How horrendous a situation this must have been. When we look around our world today, we we see a lot of atrocities. A lot of terrible things happen in our world today. But I don't think we can say that we match up with what was going on here. The thoughts of their mind were only evil continually, so much so that God was grieved in his heart. We continue then to read the depth to which the situation had devolved in verse 7. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. How horrendous the case must have been that God would say, I'm going to destroy it. Now, maybe you've had a similar experience. For those who write, uh, many times we'll write something and then we'll crumple up the paper and throw it away. And we'll write it again and we'll crumple it up and throw it away. Well, okay, in the digital age, we'll have pushed backspace. Granted. But that's not the kind of uh, racing and starting over I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about more like um, if, if, you, uh, if you take on a special project, um, maybe it's a doghouse in the back. I mean, you're building this fantastic doghouse. Maybe for you, it's a remodeling of a car. Maybe it's building a shed. For our kids, maybe it's building a, a, a masterpiece with Legos. Uh, maybe it's a puzzle that you've been working on for the last three months. How bad would it have to get that you would scrap the whole project? I mean, if you have a show car, 
Okay, guys, you have a, what, a 67 T-bird, and it is just immaculate. I mean to the T. It is beautiful, and it gets a scratch on it. Are you going to take it down and get it compacted and start from scratch? No, of course not. You have way too much invested in this vehicle to go and scrap it and start all over. And God said, I am going to destroy my creation. That's how bad it had gotten. God was grieved in his heart. He was sorry that he had created man. It's horrendous. But the very next verse begins to change the story. Verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All the terrible stuff that was going on, but yet there was a glimmer of hope. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This verse sets us up for a shift in the story. Noah found grace. And what do we know about Noah? Verse 9 tells us, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And by a surface reading, we'd say, oh, he was perfect. I will never get there. He never messed up. He was perfect. The idea here is not that he never did bad. Not that he never sinned. But he walked with God. He walked with God day by day. He had the best of intentions. And when he made a mistake, he went to God. He asked for forgiveness and he continued moving forward hand in hand with God. He was perfect in his generation. He was a notch above the rest. He followed God and this was something that was rare in this day. Remember, we had the sons of God and the daughters of men and they had people of great renown known for their wickedness. And Noah walked with God. There's another guy in Genesis chapter 5 that we read about in those generations from Adam to Noah. His name was Enoch. And we're told that Enoch walked with God. In fact, he walked with God so closely that God said, Enoch, you're my buddy, come on. And he went away with God. So this kind of terminology, this idea is not foreign in this time. And we're told here in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 that Noah walked with God. And I wonder, could it be said of you that you Walk with God. Do you spend time daily with Jesus? Not to check off your reading list. Not to say, oh, well, the pastor said I need to do this, so check mark, I'm done. (laughs) Do you walk with Jesus as a friend? Do you spend time reading Scripture to learn about your Savior? Do you spend time in His Word getting to know Him better as a personal friend? Do you spend time talking with Him in personal prayer? Do you tell him about your challenges and your joys? Do you confide in him and as a friend? Do you turn to him first in all situations? Do you walk with God? God then comes to Noah in verse 13. It says, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God lays out the situation for Noah. He doesn't pull any punches, no surprises. He lays out, things are terrible, I'm going to destroy mankind. I'm going to do away with it. I'm going to start over. He tells Noah then to go and make a boat. Go and make a boat. Mo- make that boat out of gopher wood. What do you think of first when you think of gopher wood? These little things that run around. (laughs) They're little gophers, right? They're nuisances. Well, that's not what obviously is being talked about here. Uh, Many commentators believe this was a cypress wood. Ellen White comments about the trees, however, of those days. And she says this, The trees far surpass in size, beauty, and perfect proportion any now to be found. Now, we have some pretty significant trees today. But they didn't even compare with the antediluvian trees. Those trees before the flood. Sorry. Big words. Their wood was of fine grain and hard substance, closely resembling stone. Now, some of you probably enjoy doing woodworking. I know nothing about it. (laughs) But I know there are some woods that are harder and some that are softer. 
Okay, these trees were no pine trees. Okay? Uh, they were much, much harder than the hardest wood we have today. They were like stone. This was a significant job then for Noah. Go and take and make this boat out of these enormous trees that are hard as rock. Wow. Well, that'll give you something to work on for a while. And then God says, um, beyond just making it from this, this cypress wood, um, he goes on to give Noah more information. He says, make rooms in the ark. Significant, uh, special rooms, and then go on and make three levels. Lower, middle, and upper. Three floors, three stories. So cruise ships, you know, they have numbers of floors today. That's nothing new. God set it up right here in Genesis, in the ark. Three floors. And so Noah sets out to work. God also says, though, pitch, uh, use pitch to cover the ark inside and outside, waterproofing this enormous thing so that it wouldn't just... <laughs> sink now this boat that Noah was working on was no little dinghy the ark was to be 300 by 50 by 30 cubits oh here we go difficult terminology again what is a cubit well most commentators would agree that a cubit is about 18 inches now there's debate some will say it's 20.1 inches or 20.4 inches or whatever but roughly 18 inches so if you were to take these um measurements and use them in a size that we would understand um, we're talking about a boat 450 feet long 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall this is twice as long as a 747 as long as a football field and a half you could park three space shuttles on the deck of the ark as long as 10 train boxcars end to end now, I, I had meant to walk off the sanctuary today to try and give you an idea, but I'm going to do some guesswork here. We're talking about at least two sanctuaries wide, two sanctuaries tall, probably six or eight long. We're talking enormous. This is no little boat. This isn't a boat where you walk around in circles and wear a path so much that you fall through. This was an enormous ship. And God says, Noah, go and build this crazy big boat. God told Noah that he needed this boat. He needed it to be so big because God was bringing floodwaters on the earth. Now you have to understand that this time, rain had not yet fallen on the earth. Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 tells us that the earth was watered with a mist. Raindrops? What are those? We don't know what that is. Rain had not fallen on the earth and yet God tells Noah, go and build this boat because there's going to be a flood. Rain had never fallen from the skies. The rivers had never overrun their banks. The idea of a flood was crazy. A boat this big, built on land, was foolishness. Everyone dying in some kind of a worldwide cataclysmic water event was absolutely insanity. For Noah to build this boat was nothing short of an act of faith. I can't imagine the questions that Noah must have gotten the jeering that he endured or the ridicule that was heaped upon him. For 120 years, Noah built this ark and he preached against his generation. This was 20% of his life up to this point. How many of you for the last 15, 20 years would like to have been out building some crazy thing for some event that the world has never heard of before? How do you think that would go? How do you think your neighbors would talk about you? <laughs> what do you think they'd say to you? What about the city uh, uh, code enforcement? City leaders? People around the world? Because certainly you're going to get news coverage. <laughs> you're doing some crazy stuff. And Noah built this boat, this absurdity of a thing, for 120 years. Ellen White tells us that early on there were some who joined Noah and his family in the building of the ark and the message of warning. They said, yeah, Noah, you've got it. Absolutely, we see our world is messed up. We, we're with you, man. And with time and ridicule and challenge, they cooled off in their perspective and finally they went back to where they were. 
where they'd been before, and the end condition was worse than the first. But Noah, he stayed on task for more than a century. More than any of us have been alive, he was building that boat. Noah's faith was tremendous. Think about it. He was told to build a huge vessel, corral animals in this vessel, collect food for the family and the animals, and put, uh, put all of these things, uh, all of his possessions, into this plan. And in the biblical story, Noah didn't waver. We don't see any argument between him and God. We don't see any questioning. But Noah was a human just like you and me. <laughs> And if I know anything about myself, there are questions. I'm sure as a human, Noah must have had moments when he may have had questions. When he questioned God, was this really the right thing to do? What proof was there that there's this, this flood coming? Why should I build this enormous boat? Would it even float? How could he be sure putting everything he had into this plan was a good idea? The only thing the Bible tells us is found in Genesis 6.22. Thus Noah did. According to all that God commanded him, so he did. God said it, he did it. Noah was told to build, he built a boat. Noah was told to preach, he preached. Noah was told to collect food, he collected. He had faith that what God told him to do, he must do, even if it made no sense. God then tells Noah and his family to get on the boat. As if building this crazy thing was not enough, God now says, all right, Noah, leave your preaching, leave your working, get on the boat. Now, how many of you, if I were to build a space shuttle right out here in the parking lot with my own hands, and when it was completed said, hey, come on, guys, let's go get on, we're going to the moon. Who'd like to join me for that? I'm glad you'd like to go, son. <laughs> but I expected that nobody would be real anxious to get on that boat with me. And that's exactly what Noah faced. Noah, you want me to get on that thing with you? You're nuts. I don't even know if it, if it floats, number one. And what's it going to float on? You got it on the hillside. Where's it going to go? And then Noah's given instructions to uh, take two of all the unclean animals, seven of the clean animals... Uh, well, why the difference? Because, well, the unclean, you need two to continue the species. And the seven, the clean animals, uh, they would be used for food after the flood when vegetation was just coming back and for sacrifice to God in praise and thanksgiving for what he'd done for them. So Noah and his family entered the ark. And that act, that stepping on that boat was an act of faith. They cast their lot with God. They turned their backs on the scoffers. They left their homes, their friends, all that they knew, and they went into the ark. And then we read in Genesis 7 and verse 16, and the Lord shut him in. Hmm. Profound concept. God shut them in. Has the Lord ever shut you in? Has there ever been a time in your life when it seemed that everything was coming apart, but you had complete peace? Has there ever been a time when things just seemed to stop in your life? Has there ever been a time in your life when you didn't get to do what you wanted to do so badly just to find out that tragedy struck in that very thing? My great-grandmother was from Sweden. The man that she would meet and marry was from Norway. And when Grandma was, I don't know, late teens, early 20s, she was a nurse at the time, and she was so excited, she got a ticket for the Titanic. She boarded the ship to get across the North Sea, to, to get down to port, and there was fog in the North Sea, and she missed the boat. What seemed to be a tragedy for her turned out to save her life. Has God ever shut you in? Noah and his family are in the ark. God tells Noah after seven days that rain would fall on the earth. And as they sat there on the ark, 
with all these animals making whatever noises they do, I mean, when you can find anything, it doesn't turn out real well. <laughs> I know, try to keep my kids inside. And here's this boatload of animals, this enormous ship full of animals and eight people to take care of them. And they get on the boat, the Lord shut them in, and they waited. No raindrops, no noise, nothing abnormal, just all their friends outside mocking them, making fun of them, insulting them, doing who knows what. It seems many times when our faith is tested, we have to do the same thing. We have to wait. Now, I know it will come to a shock to you, but I tend to be one that likes to move. I like to move forward. If there's a problem, let's fix it. Let's move on. Let's get going. Let's not sit here and twiddle our thumbs. Let's do something. But sometimes that's the wrong course of action. Sometimes I've had to learn that the hard way. Sometimes we simply need to be still. We need to wait. We need to watch God work things out. David tells us in Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He says, be still. Know that I am God. Be still. Watch how I'm going to take care of it. Be still. Know that I am God. Sometimes we just need to be still and watch God work. And the faith of Noah and his family, it was rewarded. In the 600th year of Noah, and you thought you were old, Noah and his family entered the ark. Then in the second month, on the 17th day of that month, the Bible tells us that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Now, have you ever stopped and thought about those words. I know many times I've read the story, and yeah, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and da, 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 da. And you read through it, and you run it through, and, and you sanitize everything in your minds. But if you stop to think about what must have happened in those days, again, remind you, prior to this event, there was no need for rain, no thunderstorms, no falling water from the sky. This event changed everything. I can imagine... Those outside of the ark are, are walking around and all of a sudden, what's going on? The earth's shaking. Why, why? Did you feel that? And they start talking to each other and then they start to see water bubbling up from the ground. What is that? That looks weird. And then, and then it starts to come up more and more and all of a sudden, boom, it explodes from the ground. There's geysers that start to go off everywhere. They start to unearth boulders on the earth's surface and throw them into the air. Trees, stuff is flying everywhere. The earth is simply erupting and the people outside are terrified for their lives. They've never seen anything like this before and it is terrifying. They begin running for their lives. Not only did the fountains of the deep break open, but the windows of heaven were open. For a world that had not seen falling rain before, this was a clear sign something was wrong. The people were running from the rising water, exploding from the earth. They're dodging boulders and trees and other items blown into the air by the geysers all around. And they're being doused by water pouring out of the sky. They knew they were in big trouble. There was no question about it. How they wished they'd listened to Noah if they'd only gotten on that crazy boat. Scripture tells us that the torrential rain continued for 40 days and 40 nights. I have to admit, I get a little tired of showers and rain when it is over a three-day period. I'm like, okay, let's get rid of the rain. I'm ready for the sun again. And that's three days of intermittent raining. This was 40 days and 40 nights of torrential downpour. That is a ton of water, folks. It was so much, the surface of the earth was covered completely by the water. We've all seen localized flooding. Here in, in Idaho, we've seen it across our nation. We've seen reports of flooding around the world. And typically, when we see a picture of flooding, we see housetops. 
and clusters of trees and, and maybe the top of a fence. But this flood was a little different. All that you could see was water. It was like standing on the coast and seeing nothing but water. There was nothing visible in the water. It was just water everywhere. Now, I like being on the water, but that's way too much. I want to see shore. If I can't see shore, I get a little nervous. There was no shore to be seen. Forty days, forty nights. Scripture records for us in Genesis chapter 7, verses 17 and onward. Water, the waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. Everything was covered by 20 feet. The ark could float over them and never touch them. 20 feet. Everything on earth was covered with water by 20 feet. That's a lot of water. That is a lot of water. It must have been terrifying for Noah, for his family and for the animals in the ark. I mean, after all, they're in this boat. They're hearing the eruptions of water. Who knows, rocks and trees are probably hitting the edge of the ark. The water is pouring on top and exploding from underneath. They can hear the cries of the people and the the animals outside. They can hear all of this happening. For 40 days, there is chaos. And finally... There's peace. It stops. The sounds stop. The rain stops. There's peace. And we read in verse 23, So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Maybe one of the saddest times on earth. Everything was decimated. It was back down to ground zero. Those who did not have faith in the words of God lost their lives. Out of all those alive at this time, only eight were saved. What a tragedy. What a senseless loss. There was absolutely no reason for it. The warning had been given 120 years of opportunity 120 years of a chance to make a decision for Jesus, to follow Noah, to get on that ark by faith, to do what God asked them to do. And yet, few chose to follow. We're told the water continued on the earth for 150 days. Five months of nothing but water. Everything on earth died except for the life on that ship. But God had mercy on Noah on his family and on the animals in the ark. Finally, Scripture tells us that a mighty wind blew and and dried out the land. After eight months, the tops of the mountains were visible. After more than a year, the earth was finally dried out. Noah and his family were able to leave the ark. They made an offering to the Lord. They worshipped him for his goodness, his protection through the last ordeal of the last year. They honored the God who spared their lives, who'd carried them through the storm, who had given them life. So friends, what is the flood in your life this morning? What is it that's closing in on you? What impending disaster is lurking just beyond the horizon? What is God asking you to be faithful with today? Is God asking you to be faithful with your time? To give him a full 24 hours of undivided attention away from the cares of the world? Is God asking you to take that special time with him daily even when it seems you can't fit in one more item in your schedule? Is God asking you to be faithful with your time? Maybe God's asking you to be faithful to the resources he's given you. Maybe he's asking you to step out by faith this morning. Maybe it's in simply returning a faithful tithe, a 10% that he says is his. And I know maybe your finances don't make sense. 10%, I don't have it. I can't. What if Noah had said, you know, God, this boat thing, it just doesn't make sense. I can't. Maybe God's asking you to be faithful with your tithe to him today. 
Maybe He's asking you to be faithful in your generosity with your offerings, that additional part to support what God is doing here. Maybe God's asking you to be faithful in your diet. Now pull your toes under the chair. I don't want to step on them too hard. Maybe God is asking you to be faithful this morning in what you put in your body. Maybe he's pleading with you to remember what your body really is, and that is his temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Maybe God is calling you to get up off your bum, get out of your recliner, and go out and breathe some fresh air. There's some flowers that need smelling. There's some sunshine to be soaked in. There's some fresh air that you desperately need. Maybe God is asking you to be faithful in your health decisions. Maybe God is asking you to be faithful this morning in your witness for Him. You clean up really good on Sabbath. You got some nice duds that you wear. But what happens about halfway home when you get cut off in traffic? What happens when your neighbor once again has thrown cans on your lawn? What happens if your neighbor's parked in your driveway again, leaking oil on it? Where's your Christianity then? When is you, where is your walk with Jesus then? Is it real? Is God asking you to be faithful in your witness for Him? What is God asking you to be faithful with today? You may very clearly understand what it is. It's that nagging idea that you just can't get rid of. You know you need to change your way and you just don't really want to. But maybe you've been ignoring that nagging impression for a long time, so long that you've become numb to the impressions of God. I want to encourage you to pray. Ask God to reveal to you what it is that He wants for you today. God will reveal what He wants you to be faithful with. He will. But be ready, because He will. I want to challenge you today to seek God's guidance in your life for that area where He wants you to step out by faith, when it doesn't make sense, when it seems fanatical, when it seems crazy, I want to encourage you to step out by faith. No matter how crazy it may seem, follow his lead. Follow his guidance through his word, through prayer, through counsel from Christian brothers and sisters. I want to challenge you this morning to walk by faith, to walk with God. And may you, like Noah, have faith in the midst of the flood. Father in heaven, We thank you, Lord, for the story of Noah. We thank you, Lord, for his faith, his determination to act on what he believed. And Lord, today as we prepare to go from this place, to spend time with our families, to be out in nature, to prepare for a new week, we pray, Lord, that you will give us that faith. May we step out by faith. May we do that thing that you are calling us to do, no matter how crazy it seems, no matter how much it doesn't make sense. Lord, may we follow you with all of our being with all of our time, with all of our resources, with all of our influence. Lord, may we keep our eyes on you and may we be faithful at all costs. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your love for us and for your blessings. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been blessed in your time with us today uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sabbath. May the Lord bless you. Have a great week.